All right, it kind of looks like everybody's back. Um, I'm not 100% sure if everyone's back yet, but um, I will again stall for just a few minutes just to be on the safe side. Uh, it, so if you're watching from home, and even if you're watching this again, I'm starting a new recording. So although I have one set of slides, I'll still have two separate videos, mostly because otherwise it would be a three hour long video. Uh, it's just easier to have two separate files. So there'll still be two video files uh, available with one slide. Actually, maybe it's probably easier in retrospect to do two sets of slides, two sets of videos. And it looked like I stopped exactly when I was expecting to anyway. So maybe going forward, I'll just kind of keep it that way. Um, a lot of this is me just trying to sort of make a lot of this up as I go along because uh, it's a slightly different format. As I mentioned in, uh, in the... Uh, message that I sent around. This is the first time I've taught this course in person since the original uh, COVID-19 lockdown one. Uh, I was in the middle of teaching this class when uh, we all got sent back home. So I actually haven't had a chance to teach this in person uh, since that. So I kind of feel like this is going to bring us back out uh, of the uh, pandemic. I'm kind of hoping like this is where I, you know, this is where we, it all went downhill. And I'm kind of hoping that this will now bring us back out of the pandemic. Not that I have any particular causal influence on how it all works, but anyway, so there'll be a separate uh, video uh, that goes along with it, which I've just started now. Um, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. Right about here. And just as I was doing before I am recording, I shall hide floating media meeting controls. There we go. Okay. So theories of concepts, and we suggested there are some major theories, and this is where I was going to, um, let's go ahead back here again. There we go. Theories of concepts. Uh, and let's talk about these key, these key questions. Uh, we've been alluding to this already. So we've suggested that uh, by forming a behavioral equivalence class, what we're doing, whether we're the simplest organism, a nematode or a fly, uh, a cat or a non-human primate or humans or algorithms uh, or a whole system of algorithms like uh, Facebook or Meta or Google might be, uh, we've all got one goal in mind, which is to take things that are different and treat them the same. And as long as we're taking things that are different and treating them the same, whether you're a cat or a house fly or Google, you got to lose some information, right? Uh, so when Instagram mentions to me that I might like a certain kind of shoe based on another search that I did, uh, it's treating me like a kind of person, a type of person who would buy that type of shoe, but it doesn't know me personally, right? Meta does not know me personally. There's not one person sitting in the Meta office or the Instagram office making decisions about me. Uh, it's a complex series of algorithms, right? It's uh, uh, it's basing its decisions on people like me. Uh, so it doesn't care what I'm like. Uh, it just cares what people like me are like. Uh, so it's lost some information. It's ignored individual things about me uh, with, to benefit its own uh, quick predictions. So concept formation from categories, representing a category of things as a concept always involves uh, losing some information and storing some information. We want to create a summary representation, a structured organization in our memory uh, to do these things efficiently, to make predictions efficiently and make decisions efficiently. We do so to benefit us, but we also lose that individual information. So these different theories uh, differ in terms of what they say is lost or what they predict is going to be lost or not stored or not represented and how much information is going to be represented. At one extreme, uh, we can represent an entire concept or category of things uh, by a set of necessary and sufficient features. Uh, so in order, so for example, in order to categorize an animal as a dog, it would have to have a set of core properties, things that are necessary and sufficient for membership in the dog category. And that's the entire representation. Any animal that has those is a dog. Any animal that doesn't is not. Uh, that's at one extreme. And at the other extreme, you might remember all of the examples of dogs you've ever seen. 
uh, bits and pieces of memories or images or uh, pictures that you've seen and information that you've read. And all of that is summarized uh, by its interconnectedness and its overlapping similarity. So one case might lose all of the individual information and store a single representation. Uh, and the alternative or at the other end of the spectrum is trying to store as much information as possible based on overlapping similarity. All of these other theories that we'll talk about, hierarchical, classical, and probabilistic view, sort of live somewhere on that continuum where we wanna see how little information we can store to our benefit, uh, but also uh, make the category as flexible and useful as possible. Uh, so let's talk first about the hierarchical approaches. When you see both of these images on the screen, it's pretty clear what you see, right? You see apples and hammers. Uh, two things that don't normally go together. Uh, you wouldn't normally hit apples with a hammer. Uh, they're not, it's not the tool that you use to consume apples for the most part. Um, but when you see these, uh, that's the first thing that should come to mind, right? Apples. Uh, most of you know that these are different kinds of apples. There's different apple varieties, right? Uh, and that some of them, like the green Granny Smith apples, are a little bit more tart. Uh, and the, uh, I don't know what these are like, honey crisps or something are a little bit sweeter uh, tasting. So you know there's some differences there. Some are sweeter than others. They have different culinary uses. They grow in different uh, climates or different areas and some of them store better than others. Uh, but they're all apples. And for the most part, we don't know the names of all the different varieties. Uh, we know maybe the names of a handful of varieties of apples. And if somebody says, uh, go to the fridge and get an apple, you would, not say what kind of apple, right? You would just go get an apple. Or if you have a list and you go into the grocery store and it says apples, you might buy the ones that look like the kind that you bought last time, uh, even if you don't know the name, you're just getting apples, right? Uh, is anybody an apple expert? Uh, someone who uh, owns an orchard or who has grown up around apple farming or orchard farming, uh, or who happens to just really, really love apples an enormous amount, so much so that you feel that you're an apple expert or you're a produce expert. If that's the case, maybe you instinctively recognize these things uh, by their variety, uh, because that's your job. If you own an orchard, uh, your job is to know exactly what kind of apples you're gonna be uh, growing in different seasons, when they store, how they should be stored. You would have more uh, specific knowledge. Uh, so you might instinctively uh, name these as kinds of apples. You might say, well, in that picture, I see Granny Smith apples and Red Delicious apples and so on. Same thing with the hammers over here. We could name these at different, at different levels. We could call them hammers. Uh, we could call them framing hammers and claw hammers uh, and whatever kind of hammer this is. Uh, or we can call them tools, right? Which is a higher level, a superordinate category that they're a member of. But most of us look at the object and we say hammers, hammers and apples, right? Uh, that's a basic level. And I'll have more to say about the basic level in two or three slides. But a basic level category for now, let's define this as the category at which you recognize objects, uh, the category at which you're most comfortable naming, recognizing, and using things. Uh, we know that all apples share the, share the same shape, roughly the same taste. Uh, they're used in the same way. They're grown in the same way. Yes, there are varieties at the subordinate level. And yes, they are members of a fruit category and a plant category at the superordinate level, but we don't name them that way. Uh, we tend to see them and instinctively name them at this basic level. Uh, and it's basic in the sense that uh, it's the base level that we operate on. Same thing with this. We don't name them as tools or kinds of hammers. We just name them as hammers. That's the basic level. They operate the same way. They use the same motor movements. Uh, they have the same shape and the same functions. Yes, maybe one of them is specialized for a certain kind of action. But if you just needed a hammer for something, uh, you could probably use any of these hammers, just like if you needed an apple for something, you could use any of these individual apples. But it's clear that there's a hierarchy, right? Uh, there's a hierarchy in the sense that there is apples, there's kinds of apples, there's individual apples down at the uh, lowest level. And even above that, there are fruits. And then above that, there are uh, living things uh, that this is a member of. There's a hierarchical structure. So this hierarchical organization suggests that for a lot of our structured knowledge representations, a lot of our concepts are structured hierarchically. 
uh, that for natural concepts especially, or for object concepts that are things that we use, like tools, things are structured in a hierarchy. Um, at different levels of abstraction, uh, the higher in the hierarchy you travel, the more abstract the representation. The lower you travel in the hierarchy, the more specific you get, the less abstract. You saw that, you could see that with the apples, right? An individual apple is not very abstract. It's a single piece of fruit. Uh, it's a piece of fruit that you happen to be holding. Obviously at this point, I would like to have remembered to have brought an apple for lunch, uh, which I did not. Uh, and I kind of wish now that I had one of those honey crisp apples, because the more I say it, the more I keep thinking like, man, I would really like an apple right about now. Uh, so individual apple, that's a thing that I have. One particular apple at this moment in time, I've got it in my hand, that's very specific. Uh, it's not very abstract because it's something I can pick up and hold and interact with. It's one apple and when it's gone, it's gone, right? That's a very specific representation. But as I get more abstract to kind of apple and to apple in general and then to fruit, uh, there's less specific information there and it's more general purpose. Uh, it's more generic information. Uh, so the questions that we want to answer here are why are there different levels? Uh, is this something to do with cutting nature at the joints? Uh, do things organize themselves hierarchically in a natural way, possibly? Uh, and that's one of, the, um, one of the strongest reasons or pieces of evidence for this hierarchical structure is that the world is organized hierarchically. There are specific examples of things. Uh, apples are a class of object. They all grow on the apple tree, but each one of them is individual. Uh, there are different kinds of apple trees, but they're related to each other and they can cross-pollinate. Uh, so there are these conceptual structures. There is this hierarchical structure. How do we know which one to use? In other words, how do we all know that we will look at the picture of the apples and I'll just name it as an apple and not access some different level of the hierarchy? In other words, how, why do we use the basic level? Uh, why do we tend to operate at this basic level? Um, can you see this in, in enough detail? Okay. Um, I can't ever wear my glasses very well when I'm talking. I can wear them when I'm like walking around and talking in a normal voice with a mask. But if you try to wear them and you're like talking a lot, they just fog up. So I can't always, I can't really see very clearly, but it looks like I, you can all see. So this is a hierarchical structure. This is a hierarchical representation of animals. Uh, and as you can see, um, we have a specific level, a basic level, and a generic superordinate level. And at each level, there's different information that's stored. Uh, so for example, um, I might think about canaries and that they can sing in their yellow. That's specific to canaries. Sure, other birds can sing, but not all birds can. And so maybe at this level of the hierarchy, this subordinate level, I store what's most useful to let me recognize one object from the other. Uh, the canaries are yellow. Uh, they can, they're singing birds. Other birds are yellow, other birds sing, and we can represent those accordingly, but not all birds do, like the ostrich, which we know is kind of an unusual bird. Um, it has long legs, it's tall, it, it can't fly. Uh, you know, a, a red-tailed hawk or a bald eagle, which there are a lot more bald eagles along the river uh, in the last few years. I don't know if you ever have if you've seen them, but I can see them roughly once a week. Uh, it's, they're becoming much more prevalent along the Thames River now. Um, they're huge, they're enormous. If you've ever seen one up close, uh, about the size of like a dog. I mean, like, I think they could probably pick up a dog. Um, large, very, very large birds, uh, impressive. Uh, so I have specific information for bald eagle, right? Large bird of prey, white head, uh, black body. So there might be features that are important for bald eagle. But these live within a hierarchical structure of birds in general. Uh, so canaries can sing in our yellow, but notice that I didn't say anything or remember any specific fact about the canary's wings. Uh, and that's because all birds have wings. So I don't need to remember that canaries have wings. I just need to know that they're a member of the bird category. And if they're a member of the bird category, they are already inheriting this property. Uh, so this is a form of structured organization uh, that is fairly efficient. I don't need to remember that canaries can fly or that canaries have feathers because I store that information at the basic level for bird. All birds 
have wings. All birds have feathers. And as you've seen, I can also assume that all birds fly unless I've specifically remembered can't fly as a feature of that particular subordinate level uh, bird. So these things, uh, this is a hierarchical structure. Uh, if I get higher in the hierarchy, animal is fairly abstract, right? There's no one shape of animal. Uh, animal is a very broad category. Uh, there's lots of kinds of animals. There's lots of different sizes of animals. Uh, so there isn't really an image that I can have that would be a stereotypical animal, but I might store some features like animals have skin. And they can move around. Uh, they eat things and they breathe uh, oxygen, right? Those are things that animals do. Uh, that maybe non-animals don't. Uh, and so at each level, I'm storing something that's fairly gen that's more and more progressively generic, uh, progressively more abstract, with the understanding that everything below that level in the hierarchy inherits those properties. Uh, and this allows you to represent uh, features uh, in the least number of places. Uh, I don't need to remember for every individual bird species I know, that each one of them has feathers because I just know that they are a member of the bird category. So for canary, I need to know three things. It is a bird, it can sing, and it is yellow. Once I know it is a bird, I also therefore know that it has wings, can fly, and feathers. And I, from bird, I know that a bird is an animal. So I know that canaries also have skin and they move around and they breathe. This has been tested uh, empirically uh, by research that goes fairly well back. I talk about this in the textbook um, by Collins and Quillian, who did a number of studies in the late 1960s and early 1970s to determine if this is representative of how humans store information. And the way they did it was with a sentence verification or property verification task. And you ask people uh, to answer questions uh, to verify properties. Uh, so for example, whoops, if I uh, ask you, a canary can sing, you answer yes really quickly. If I ask you, a canary has scales, you answer no pretty quickly, uh, maybe not quite as quickly because scales is not stored anywhere. Uh, so you would have to search through your hierarchy. Uh, canary can sing is fast. Canary has wings, also fast, but maybe just a few milliseconds less fast. And the understanding is that in order to get to that knowledge, I need to travel to a different region of conceptual space. In other words, I have to expand my activation uh, in my conceptual network. Because when I hear canary, I automatically get features like yellow and can sing uh, because that's connected to canary. When I hear ostrich, I automatically get big, right? So I have those features that are closely associated. Some of these other things like a canary has skin is obviously true, but I don't store that information in the same place. In order to answer the question and verify the property, a canary has skin or a canary has a face, uh, which are not typically features that you store with the idea of a canary or the image of a canary, I would just need to travel further in the hierarchy. And so what Collins and Quillians found is that reaction time to make these decisions was predicted uh, by this conceptual structure, by this hierarchical structure, or rather people's reaction time allowed them to infer the existence of this hierarchical structure, that there are certain properties that take longer to verify, and those properties that take longer to verify are the ones that would be on a different hierarchical structure, a different level of the hierarchy. Even like some of the um, reaction time is a little bit slower also because like it's Kind of unexpected like for example if you when they're asked all oh, the birds have feathers it's kind of like an obvious thing so they didn't really expect it so it took them like a bit to like there could yes there's definitely something uh, so the question was if you didn't hear uh, are these uh would some of these be susceptible to sort of surprise or expectation uh some of these questions uh these properties would be closely associated um so canaries can say uh, that seems like something that would be a close associate. Wouldn't be surprising to be asked that. Uh, and so you should be able to verify that really quickly. But other questions like a canary has skin uh, is going to take longer. First of all, it's going to sort of be, it's going to sound a little weird to be asked that uh, because it's not a property that we associate with canaries. And that was the, uh, ex that was the explanation that Collins and Quillian gave is that it's not a property uh, that we uh, closely associate or store in our memories along with the concept of a canary. 
Uh, so therefore it does strike us as unusual and unexpected, even though we know it's correct. Uh, we have to verify its correctness uh, by thinking about a larger region of perceptual space. But that's exactly why it would be surprising. Uh, it's not a usual thing to hear. We don't think about canaries having skin and faces, even though they clearly do. Uh, it's just not something that is a close associate or uh, a near feature. Is that okay? So let's think about the relationship though. Let's talk about this hierarchical structure using a slightly different example. Uh, again, these are animals, but now I've chosen uh, animals uh, with some other uh, superordinate categories. And what I wanna talk about is the relationship of objects within those levels. Uh, so here's our basic level uh, category. Whoops, uh, I keep going back and forth every time I wanna push here. Here's our basic level categories, cows, dogs, cats, and lizards, and so on. Uh, these are the areas at which we would expect to identify objects. If we see any one of a number of cows, we would say cow. If we see any one of a number of cats, we would say that's a cat, right? Whether it's my cat, a different kind of cat, someone else's cat, we would just name them as cats, right? They all look like cats. Um, we can see that there is a lower level, a more uh, specific level of dog breeds and cat breeds and so on. So the different kinds of cats and different kinds of dogs and different kinds of cows. Uh, and most of us are familiar with some, but maybe not with all of them. Uh, so we don't tend to name the objects at that level. And there's a higher level structure where there's plants, animals, and vehicles. Uh, what I want to point out here is that there's a relationship of the objects within uh, that level. Uh, at the top level, I suggested here, I've written here low within and low between. Uh, what I mean is uh, the similarity of the objects in that category are not held together by very much similarity. There's a low similarity of objects within the animal category. As a label, animal denotes a really broad range of things. As a label, plant uh, denotes a broad range of things. So this low similarity of things within the plant category and within the animal category. Not a lot of animals, a lot of animals look like each other, but a lot of animals don't look like other animals, right? There's a lot of variability. So similarity, perceptual similarity is not a very useful cue to name objects and recognize objects at the superordinate level because things don't always look like things that they're named as. Furthermore, there's a low similarity between the categories. Uh, just like all animals, you know, animals don't look alike, animals also don't look like plants and look like vehicles. Uh, so in terms of overlapping similarity, it's not a very useful piece of information at the superordinate level. Uh, similarity is just low. Uh, things don't look like each other. Uh, even though we call them animal, they may not share a lot of features. At the bottom level, at the, the most specific and superordinate level, similarity is high within a category and between categories. In other words, similarity doesn't seem to do very much up here. It can't be a very useful cue to let us know what is in a category. There's too much similarity at the subordinate level. Uh, just like we saw the pictures of all the apples, they all looked similar. Sure, there were different colors, but I mean, they were kind of all the same shape and the same style. The hammers were different, but they all kind of looked alike. So at the subordinate level, similarity is uh, immediately apparent within a category, but it's also apparent between categories. Uh, poodles and Labradors might look different, but they share more than they don't share, right? Uh, Siamese cats and short-haired cats might look different, but they also share a lot of features. So similarity isn't isn't strong enough of a predictive cue to let you know the difference necessarily between those objects. Uh, it doesn't necessarily let you name the objects uh, very easily because there's a lot of similarity within a category, but there's also similarity between contrasting categories. However, at the middle level, uh, similarity is still fairly high within the category but it's also fairly low between categories. And so you can reliably use similarity as a diagnostic cue to let you name the object and know what is in that category and at the same time distinguish it from other categories and other contrasting categories. 
it's the ideal place. Similarity is relatively high, but the abstraction is high as well. So computationally, this is a great place to name objects because dogs look like other dogs. Even if they're different breeds, they all kind of look the same. They share the, share the same shape. Uh, you interact with them the same way and you treat them the same way. So similarity works well as a cue there to recognize what's true about dogs. And it also works well uh, to distinguish dogs from cows, cats, and lizards, because there's lower similarity between those contrasting categories. Did you have a, yeah. I'm just wondering what, what is the highest like level of abstraction at the superordinate level? Is it like everything? Yes, eventually you would get to the category of things, uh, all things or, so yeah, you could go from animal to uh, living things, for example, living things and non-living things. And then you could have, uh, things that you know and things that you don't know. So eventually you'll get to the point where it, it's, a, it's all the stuff that you have ever known uh, would be the most abstract and everything else would be the things that you don't know. You could imagine going more specific and more subordinate because uh, there's different kinds of Labrador dogs. There's different kinds of dogs, meaning your dog and someone else's dog. Uh, so eventually you get to very specific categories, uh, which is, you know, my Labrador Retriever dog today <laughs> uh, is a very specific category. So it's specific to this moment. Uh, and then at the very top, you could imagine uh, the category of animals folds into the category of living things, which folds into the category of things, which would then fold into the category of all of the stuff that you know. I'm wondering along, sort of along the same vein, like if you have to, if you come across something that you don't know, and it's like a brand new thing for you, um, do you start to categorize it from the bottom up or from the top down or somewhere in the middle where it's like, maybe this is the closest to a dog versus like, maybe this is close to a poodle, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so that's exactly what would happen. Uh, and, and that's, or not exactly, but that's the prediction about what we would expect to happen uh, is that when you're faced with something that's unfamiliar, and if you didn't hear the question, so the question was, uh, how would you categorize something that you're not immediately familiar with? Uh, and the best explanation is that we would categorize it by associating its closest basic level uh, approximate. Uh, because this basic level, as we'll see in the next few slides, it's that level at which objects tend to share the same shape uh, and they have the same features and they tend to have the same behaviors. So if we're talking about canines, uh, how many of you have run into some of the coyotes uh, that are around London? Have you seen these? Uh, so they look like dogs, right? Um, except they're not dogs, they're coyotes. Um, and what's the distinguishing feature that lets you know it's a coyote and not a dog? Does anybody know? They like the tail or something? Tails, straight down. So your dog, your domestic dogs, for a variety of reasons, having to somehow do with domestication, their tail kind of points up. Even dogs that have tails that mostly point down, they'll kind of point up a little bit. Whereas you know, the fox and the coyote and the wolf have a tail that points straight down. So if you see something that looks like a medium-sized dog uh, early in the morning without people around and it has a tail that's going straight down, uh, it's coyote, right? Um, you don't need to know it's a coyote. You might just say, well, that kind of looks like a dog and it gets you into dog conceptual space. Only when you get closer, you might realize that it's lacking a feature that you are familiar with. And only if you knew that that was a feature uh, that told you the difference between coyotes and dogs, uh, you might otherwise just assume that it's a dog. So that, that's what would happen. You would likely categorize it based on those basic level uh, categories. And you certainly wouldn't assume that it's a lizard, cow, or a cat, right? You would get, it would get you in the right space, canine space. Uh, and you'd be able to tell the difference between that uh, coyote and some other uh, animal that you might be able to, you might run into uh, out in the woods or something. There are more of them this, there are more of them over the last, every year there are more coyotes. Uh, I'm not sure when they all moved in, uh, but when I moved to London 20 years ago, I don't remember seeing coyotes anywhere. Uh, and it seems like every year there's a few more. So even though the city has expanded, the number of coyotes also seems to have expanded. Uh, in, in, I, I guess they, they thrive somehow in that sort of boundary between city and rural, uh, where they can be down by the river or down by the railroad or something. Okay, so basic level categories, As just to summarize, a high level of within category similarity means that members of a category tend to be similar. And a low level of between category similarity means that members of contrasting categories 
uh, tend to be dissimilar. So this similarity is a useful cue at the basic level. Uh, you know, whether you're familiar with the category or not, uh, it's computationally a useful cue because of this natural occurring within category similarity and this naturally occurring between category similarity. If there are joints uh, in the natural world, uh, this is one way we can use basic overlapping similarity to cut nature at those joints. So this basic level uh, is a place where perceptual similarity uh, makes itself known as some of the joints along which we wish to carve up uh, the natural world. Um, I have two uh, supplemental readings on the website uh, and I'm only including them because I'm using some excerpts over the next few slides. I don't expect you to read the entire chapter. So one is chapter seven from a book by Greg Murphy um, called The Big Book of Concepts. It's an excellent book if you really like concepts, uh, but it is big, uh, which is why it's called The Big Book of Concepts. Um, and that's from 20, 2004, I think, is when it was published. And this is chapter seven where he talks about a hierarchical structure. And I've highlighted just a few key points with some of the evidence. I don't expect you to read the whole thing. I really just want you to remember these key points. But the reading is there in case you want to go back uh, and look at some of the broader context. I'm also going to talk about a study uh, by uh, James Tanaka and Barbara Taylor. Tanaka and Taylor, 1991, which looks at experts and how they might act differently than novices at uh, understanding things within a basic level. I'm going to talk about one experiment or one study they did in that paper. And that's the one that I'd like you to be familiar with. So you've got the whole paper to look at, uh, but I won't be asking or examining you on questions about the studies that we don't talk about, only the studies that we do talk about. Uh, so you can sort of treat that as supplemental information. I don't expect you to read the whole paper. Just be familiar with what's on the slides here and the ideas that we're talking about in class. Uh, but I do, I do find that it's helpful to sort of have those background readings. So from Greg Murphy, uh, he's talking about the work of Eleanor Roche, whose name is going to come up in a few different classes. Uh, it comes up today when we talk about uh, concepts. It's going to come up later when we talk about language uh, and thinking. Eleanor Roche's work in the 1970s really revolutionized how people think about mental structures and how people think about concepts and organizations. Uh, and when Murphy says a highly series of highly influential studies, it's underselling how influential Roche's work was. Uh, at the time. Uh, so this was in the 1970s, uh, and she developed a series of operational definitions. It's, it's Roche's work that really came up with the idea of a basic level category. The idea of hierarchical structure was present in cognitive science, uh, but the idea that we would naturally gravitate towards this basic level category and that we would maximize uh, within category similarity for its distinct and uh, distinctiveness between categories and that we would name features in certain ways uh, owes its debt to Roche's work. Uh, first, the basic level of object categories was shown to be the most inclusive level at which category members possess a significant number of con common attributes. Another way to say that is, it's the most abstract level at which things are still similar. Remember, one of the biggest questions we wanted to answer in concepts and categories is, how much information is stored versus how much information is lost. And the ideal conceptual representation is one that keeps as much as possible and doesn't remember the things that are not useful. Uh, in other words, you don't necessarily need to store the difference between individual apples at the store that day, even though you can recognize them. What you need to store is what's true about apples in general. So you want your category representation to be abstract because it's useful. You want it to be abstract because it's general, but you want it to retain enough information uh, so that you can recognize objects. So this is the most abstract level at which things still look alike. Does everyone have sort of different basic categories because of like personal experiences? Like for example, an apple farmer wouldn't necessarily see a bunch of apples and say apple as their basic category. Yes. Yes, so that's exactly right. So if you didn't hear the question, does, does, do people have different levels, uh, different basic categories based on their experience? Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, so this basic level category is fairly stable uh, within a culture uh, because apples are apples, right? Your experience with apples might vary, uh, but the basic level at which we've decided to label them as a culture is still roughly the same. 
However, uh, you may have a lot more experience than someone else. Uh, or apples may not be a very prominent uh, you know, snack fruit uh, in one country or another. There are other fruits which are common in other countries. Uh, and so that may be more prominent uh, in the conceptual representation. So there are individual differences based on your experience, based on your language, based on your culture. And the Tanaka and Taylor result, which I'll talk about in about five minutes, um, gets at exactly the point that you're raising, which is if you're an expert, if you're highly familiar with the domain, uh, then your basic level category shifts a little bit down to a subordinate level because you know a lot more about those features. Experts tend to perceive more uh, at that subordinate level. In other words, they show the same advantages of a basic level classification, but at a more specific level, uh, which intuitively should uh, seem reasonable. If you are a uh, an avid bird watcher. Does anybody engage in like sort of recreational birding or bird watching or identifying bird species or anything like that? I've always wanted to, but I just haven't gotten around finding time. But uh, it's the kind of thing I can imagine myself doing uh, at some time as a trend closer towards like retirement or something. Like I'd be really into like identifying birds or something. It just seems like it's fun, right? Because they're entertaining uh, and they're you know fun to observe. Anyway. If you're a really good birder, that's what you're doing. You're trying to identify bird species, right? So that you can say that I saw this pil pil pileated woodpecker uh, or uh, a certain kind of um, you know, a juvenile bald eagle or something like that. So I'm identifying different kinds of birds. Uh, that's different from just recognizing them as birds. So expert birders have much more specific knowledge because that's what they're practicing to do, recognize that things at that subordinate level. Anyway, so this is this is object number, this is uh, attribute number one of the basic level. It's the most abstract level at which things are still uh, similar. Attribute number two, uh, basic level categories are the most inclusive categories, in other words, the most abstract, at which highly similar sequences of movements are made to category mem members. Uh, in other words, it's the most abstract level at which you tend to grab objects or manipulate objects uh, in the same way. Um, in this study, subjects were asked to write down the movements they make when interacting with objects that belong to superordinate, basic, and subordinate categories. Um, as with an attribute listing study, subject listed more movements for basic and subordinate level categories. Uh, Lots of different kinds of pants, but we treat them in the same way, right? We put pants on in the same way, regardless of what style of pants they are. Maybe there's some tiny differences if something has a button fly or a zipper fly or no fly at all, right? Uh, but other than that, uh, you treat your, you, know, you put your pants on in the same way. You grasp pens and pencils uh, and writing implements in the same way. Uh, and depending on what kind of smartphone you have, you treat your smartphone in the same way. You pick it up in roughly the same way. And we were commenting that when you take a bite out of an apple, uh, we all take a bite out of an apple by taking a bite out of the top uh, side of the apple or the side of the apple. That's the common place uh, to grab and eat an apple. So we tend to treat these things with the same motor movements. Um, articles of clothing beyond pants, which is more abstract, more uh, superordinate, we have to we have to interact with in different ways, right? We grab them and put them on in different ways. And fruit of different kinds of fruits, we're gonna interact with in different ways. Um, other attributes of this basic level category found that objects with basic and subordinate level categories had shapes that were more similar than objects within superordinate categories. This restates the point that I made earlier, which is that similarity is high at the lower levels. Dogs are shaped like dogs. And that's why we would likely uh, misclassify a coyote uh, or a wolf as a dog because they have dog shapes and they have dog parts and they have dog behaviors. And maybe there's one critical feature, the tail, uh, that lets you know that it isn't a member of the domestic dog category. Uh, but for the most part, it's got that same shape. Um, and this whole uh, list of research, so uh, Murphy suggests there are lots of other things that come up. So we tend to list features of basic level categories, uh, we list more features. Uh, if you ask someone to list members of a concept, uh, if you say list fruits, people don't list subordinate fruits, they list apple, banana, and strawberry and pear. Um, we can, uh, they share the same movements, they have the same shapes, 
uh, they're more effective as primes uh, for visual comparison. So we tend to recognize and uh, think about objects uh, at this basic level. Um, lots of word use. So they tend to be the first words that people use uh, when uh, children learn the names for objects. Uh, we all learn basic level categories. We don't learn dog breeds an animal. We learn dog, cow, pig, and so on. Uh, so we tend to learn basic level categories. And um, also within, uh, so they're, they're first acquired, they're more frequently used in text. Uh, people name objects at the basic level, uh, and they tend to be short names as well. Uh, so subordinate level categories have more qualifiers, right? A domestic short-haired cat versus cat. Uh, so in order to be more uh, specific, you need to have more qualifying text. So subordinate, superordinate names are often mass nouns. Subordinate names include basic level names like domestic short-haired cat uh, and so on. There's a little bit, uh, there's differences between the informativeness and the distinctiveness. Uh, so the basic level category is informative, uh, the differences among category labels uh, and differentiation. In other words, it tells you something about the object, but it's also distinctive and it lets you classify something as a dog instead of a cat. So it's both informative, tells you what to expect and predict, and it's distinctive, it helps you classify. Uh, this again gets at the uh, output of that over uh, the similarity structure that I discussed a few slides uh, back. Uh, at the subordinate level, it's informative, but it's not very distinctive because there's a lot of overlapping similarity. Uh, and at the superordinate level, uh, the information that you tend to perceive or store uh, is not very informative, uh, even as it is uh, distinctive. Well, that's not very useful information. I just felt my phone kept giving me a notification. Most of my notifications are off, but apparently uh, the weather notification I didn't silence yet. So it was just letting me know that there's a storm this evening, which like I already knew. Um, that's why I should leave the phone on the desk there. You got to silence the notifications when you're in the middle of a lecture because you don't want to have something interfering with you uh, and taking away your, so anyway. Remind me next time. I'll remind myself. Silence weather alerts because uh, it's not useful information right now. Um, okay, let's talk about the uh, Tanaka and Taylor results. So, um, summarizing, children name these uh, faster. They're listed first, uh, and they tend to have short names. Um, basic level expertise. Uh, so, I've been hinting at the idea that we're experts at categorizing things at the basic categorizing things at the basic level. We see objects, we name them automatically. You see a bananas and pears and apples, you name them as bananas, pears, and apples. You don't give the sub-variety and you don't tend to say fruit unless you see a whole bunch of different kinds of fruit connect, you know, compared to a bunch of books, for example, and you would say, that's fruit and those are books because that's the distinction that's being asked for there, the context. But experts do things differently. Experts tend to behave uh, as if the subordinate level, the more specific level, is their basic preferred level of recognition. Um, most people are experts, in quotes, at the basic level because we do it automatically. Um, but there are lots of novice expert differences. Uh, I suggested that bird experts, bird watchers and ornithologists are able to identify species automatically uh, because that's what they've been training to do. And, uh, tree experts. We'll talk about a study with tree experts in another uh, in another lecture when we talk about uh, expertise. Uh, tree experts tend to classify trees according to their type, uh, the type of experts that they are. Um, in the study that I wanted to discuss in a little bit more detail uh, by uh, Tadaka and Taylor, they looked specifically at this finding. So they specifically wanted to know. If we ask novices and experts to list features or to tell us about concepts, what will they do? Uh, well, everybody, whether regardless of their level of expertise, still default to this basic level that Rosh suggested we do, uh, or will experts behave differently? In other words, will experts show an, an expert level advantage uh, at this subordinate level? 
Uh, one of the studies they did, uh, which is slightly better structure there, um, did something like that. So they took 12 dog experts. So these would be people who uh, you know, work with dogs professionally from a local dog organization and bird experts who were members of the local bird watching association. So people, a small group of subjects, small, small group of participants, some of whom are experts uh, in a particular domain. Uh, and then we can match them, of course. Um, so the group of dog experts consisted of uh, a variety of, of range of bird experts, uh, and none of the subjects had expertise in both. Uh, so we can get people who are dog experts who are not bird experts. We can get people who are bird experts who are not dog experts. So we've got experts and novices within the same sample. Um, and essentially, they saw a list of drawings and photographs of objects, 86 of them, and embedded within that were dogs and birds, uh, along with lots of other objects. Uh, and their job was just to name these objects in this particular case. Um, so dog exemplars, uh, but also there's furniture, full, uh, vehicles, sports equipment, cooking utensils, uh, and so on. Subject was seated at a table directly across from the experimenter. Subjects were instructed that they would see a series of pictures depicting common everyday objects. Their task was to say the word of the object as quickly as possible, kind of like we did uh, when I suggested, what do you see when you, you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this apple? It's an apple. So that's exactly what they were doing. Hand, except this is in 1991, it's much more, uh, they didn't have the, uh, uh, weren't doing this over a computer screen, they would have just handed them a photograph and say, what is it? And they would just write it down. So it's a small group of participants, but they're high uh, experienced experts. And we just wanna know what's the first thing that comes to mind. And several other studies, as you'll see, they also uh, uh, listed uh, features about the objects um, and a variety of things. This is a naming study. Uh, and in this case, you can see that naming responses reflected what you would expect. Um, for dog experts um, within their area of expertise, uh, for basic level categories, if they were the expert, uh, they listed, they tended to label things more often at this subordinate level. In other words, dog experts, expert, uh, they tend to see dogs and they name the dog breed, uh, which is what you would expect. And you see the same thing with birds. Birds experts even more so because there's a lot more varieties of birds, right? I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of dog breeds, but there's even more uh, bird species. So your bird experts, uh, that's their job is to name birds at that subordinate level. Um, and you can see at the basic level, uh, the novice uh, response tends to be at the basic level. So what you see is a, is a distinction between experts and novices. When novices look at something, they name things at that basic level. But for those sub category of stimuli that are within your area of expertise, you switch to a subordinate level naming. So across all of the objects, uh, the, the bird experts are naming things primarily at the basic level until they get to birds and then they use a subordinate level. Uh, terminology. So experts are perceiving things differently. And if you read the full paper, uh, they show the same kind of advantage for feature listing. Uh, they show the same kind of advantage uh, that Roche found for basic level categories. Experts behave that way at the subordinate level, but only within their domain of expertise, uh, not within other domains. Okay, let's talk about two different theory, two additional theories of concepts. We've been talking about this hierarchical structure. I'm keeping an eye on the, uh, on the time here. We're a quarter till, we've got about a half an hour left. How is everybody doing in terms of attention? Uh, is it, is your attention flagging or you're okay? I think we can make an extra uh, 30 minutes, I hope. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about the classical view. Uh, and then I'm gonna summarize the probabilistic view. We got a short demonstration that we can do, uh, and then we should be able to uh, finish things up um, in just the right amount of time. So a classical view is an, sort of an earlier theory of categorization. There's still some reason to assume that it defines some of our characteristics and some of our behaviors. So the classical view has a lot of limitations as we'll see. The limitations being that we don't tend to be so strict in our definitions. Uh, it's a definitional approach to categorization. 
But that said, although we don't behave as if we have strict definitions, we often give strict definitions to others. So when we're communicating information about concepts, we often still give a definition, even if we know that definition is insufficient. Um, so according to this classical view, um, the category is represented by a set of necessary and sufficient features, jointly necessary and sufficient. In other words, in order to be a member of the dog category, you have to have a series of properties that are necessary. Uh, in other words, you need them uh, and they are sufficient. Anything else is irrelevant. As long as you have those features, you're a dog. And the other properties of dogs, like the way their hair is cut, are not needed. Uh, that's not necessary. It's neither necessary nor sufficient, but having dog shape and dog ears and dog tails might be necessary and sufficient. For that reason, according to this uh, theory, category membership is an, is an all or none process. If, a, if your definition is a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, if you've got them, if you, you know, they're necessary and you have those uh, properties and they're sufficient, uh, then you're as good a member of a category as anything else, right? Uh, so there, it doesn't account for graded category membership and typicality effects very well. What would classical view do about platypuses? It would not do very well uh, with the platypuses. And it turns out that the classical view does not do very well with lots of natural concepts, because although we can agree that maybe uh, a platypus would have a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, and uh, for lots of biological categories, it might be their DNA, for example. Uh, we don't often have access to that, and we tend to rely on characteristic features instead. Uh, so the, this particular view is unnecessarily strict uh, in its description, but it does uh, suggest that we think about objects as if they fall into this uh, structure. We often communicate information by highlighting those features which are closest to being a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. Some categories do work this way. Um, a square, for example, has a set of necessary and sufficient features, right? A square is any object that has a uh, four equal sides and four right angles. If you have those things, you are a square. If you don't have those things, you are not a square. And it doesn't matter what, uh, what material you're made of, doesn't matter how big you are, size is irrelevant, doesn't matter what color, uh, all you need is four equal sides, four right angles. If you've got that, you're a square. If you don't have that, you're not a square. None of the other properties matter. So there's no such thing as a good square and a bad square. You're either a square or you're not a square, right? You're some other non-square shape. Uh, and otherwise, this is a fairly clear uh, example of a classically defined concept. A lot of mathematical and geometric concepts are classically defined. I mean, we know the difference. There is, things are either a square or they're not, right? There's no good squares. There's no semi-squares. Um, and so as we can all agree, this is clearly a good example of a square, except we also, you probably know, because I talked, I think I used this example uh, in my fall class, if you saw it. Uh, this is obviously not a, the best square. It's not a perfect square. Uh, the one on the left, as you can see, is not perfectly, uh, aligned. If I put the two on top of each other, you can see that uh, this line is not truly a 90 degree angle. In fact, you can see that I drew it badly. There's an extra pixel uh, up there and there's an extra pixel there. And this line kind of tilts just a little bit off uh, the vertical, which means that the angles are not 90 degree right angles and the sides are not all equal. So for definitional purposes, the one on the right is a square. The one on the left is not a square. But for practical purposes, we would just call them both squares, right? I mean, unless you knew uh, that one of them was not a square uh, and that they didn't exactly align, you can see the mismatch there. Uh, so that you can see that one of them is just a little bit off by one pixel. So it's not the best square, but the point is we would probably label them both as squares, even though we know one of them is not technically following the definition. So this shows where the classical view can be too strong. Although it gives us a good understanding of what it means to be a square, you've got to have four equal sides, four right angles. It also suggests that we can conveniently ignore that definition uh, whenever we want, <laughs> right? Because one of them looks 
like a square. It looks square-like enough uh, for us to be able to treat it as such. And in fact, a, a system of classification that's that strict wouldn't be very useful because as soon as something varies by even just a little bit, or if you're looking at it in the wrong way, or uh, if somebody takes a square and then moves it a little bit, you could say, well, it's, it's no longer a square. Uh, it doesn't look like a square to me because I'm seeing it from a different angle. Um, that would be a very poor object recognition system. It might be a great way to define a concept mathematically, but it's not a very good way to recognize objects. Uh, so instead, um, we've come up with alternative probabilistic accounts. And one of the first ways in which this was identified uh, was the philosopher of language in the, 19, in the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who made a lot of contributions uh, to cognitive psychology. One of them was the idea of family resemblance. And at the time, philosophers would have been uh, more likely to find the classical view uh, to be uh, appropriate. Uh, so that, sure, we can agree that something is or isn't a square, but uh, we wanna figure out what makes something a square. We wanna define what those uh, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions are. Wittgenstein said, that's great if you wanna do that, but that's not how people behave. Uh, so maybe we can define things, but we certainly don't use them. And he said, uh, you know, take any word. And he suggested, consider, for example, the proceedings that we call games. We can label things as games as being board games, uh, word games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. There's lots of different kinds of games, right? Uh, there are games that are physical, games that are mental, games that are lexical. Um, and then say, what's common to all of them? In other words, what gives us the right to call them games? Uh, and he suggests that there isn't anything common. Uh, don't just say there must be something common, otherwise they wouldn't be called games, but look and see whether there is anything common. And if you look, you won't see one common thing, you'll see similarities and relationships. So Wittgenstein's point is that for a lot of concepts, it's really difficult to figure out what is the definition. What is that one feature, that critical feature that lets you know that the object is an apple and not a pear? Uh, what is the critical feature that lets you know that it, something is a dog uh, or a cat or something is a dog or a coyote? Sure, there might be something that's highly predictive, but if a dog was born, truly a dog, not a coyote, and for a variety of reasons, uh, its tail pointed straight down, it wouldn't become a coyote, right? Even though it had a feature that was consistent with coyote and not dog, we would know it's still a dog. There's other features that we use. So Wittgenstein's suggestion is that concepts are represented around a family resemblance. Things in a category resemble each other the way people in a category, people in a family resemble each other. Um, I've got uh, two uh, slightly younger brothers. Uh, one is a year and a half, the other one is three years younger. Uh, and not surprisingly, we look similar because uh, we're all roughly the same age. Uh, we're all, you know, same parents. Uh, so we look like family members, but clearly we're not the same person. There isn't one feature that you would say, well, they are all members of that family because they have exactly that feature. And you can tell they're not the member of this family because this family has this other feature. You would see the larger family. If you've ever gone to a, I don't know if any of you have large families, you go to a large family reunion or a wedding or some kind of family function, the types of things which, you know, sadly, we haven't been able to do as much uh, in the heavier uh, per periods of sort of heavier restrictions during COVID, but most of us have seen our families, right? I mean, that's what you do. You can see that the family looks like a family. There's a family resemblance, but there isn't one eye color or one head shape or one hairstyle that everybody has that you would say, that's it, that's the feature. If they've got it, they're a member of that family. If not, they're not. There's similarities and there may be no one feature, but there's lots of features that overlap. And that's Wittgenstein's point is that we actually don't have the ability to use those necessary and sufficient features. What we have is a, an understanding of family resemblances. So a conceptual representation system or a good concept theory is one that lets us store the family resemblances uh, and ignore uh, some of the non-overlapping features without having to emphasize definitions so strongly. Uh, and what that is, is a, um, is a system that represents typicality structure. Typicality structure is one that's seen really clearly here. This is from some of uh, Roche's research on 
uh, basic level categories. And this is a, a fairly simple experiment where we would ask people to tell us whether or not this is a typical member of a category. And we would say, okay, for the member of, for categories in the, members of the fruit category, how typical is apple? People would say yes, peach, yes. And we get the whole way down to pumpkin, avocado, and olive. Maybe people are familiar with avocados, pumpkins, and olives, but they don't strike many people, certainly not when this study was done, as being very typical of fruits. So we can agree that being a member of the fruit category, we actually know that there is a, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions to be a fruit, right? To be a fruit, you've gotta be the seed bearing part of a plant, right? And so figs have seeds in them, coconuts are seeds, uh, pomegranates have seeds in them, avocados have one big seed right in the middle, right? These are all seed bearing members of, uh, of a vegetable, of a plant. So they're all fruits, but some of them are better fruits, just like they are all squares, but some of them are better squares. Uh, there are lots of birds, but some of them are better birds. In other words, we, we agree that they are more typical. They live in the center of the bird conceptual space. This shows um, Wittgenstein's family resemblance principle. Uh, robins, bluebirds, and seagulls might be really typical. And one of the reasons they're typical is that the features that are present in robin and the features that are present uh, in some of these other birds are shared by lots of other birds. In other words, they have a lot of those family resemblance prototypical features. Whereas flamingo, although we can recognize flamingos as a bird and we can recognize them, we also understand that they are, they have a lot of features that no one else has. Uh, same thing with olive. We know that olive is a fruit, but it has features, at least culinarily, that lots of other fruits do not have. Right? It, it doesn't have a sweetness the same way that maybe an apple does. So some of these atypical or less typical category members, we know they're still members of the category, but they don't have as many features that are typical of the other category members. So they don't have as much family resemblance. This would be like the cousin uh, that is you know, a member of the family, but for whatever reason has features that look a little different. Right, uh, Or this would be like an, if you have two or three or four siblings, maybe one of them is taller than all the rest. Uh, or maybe one of them has lighter hair than everyone else. Uh, and so there might be features which are a little less typical, but they have some features in common, but they're clearly ones that are a little bit less common. They're the less typical. They don't have as much of the overlap. Um, people do this even with even and odd numbers. Clearly even numbers and odd numbers should uh, characterize or be characterized by a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, but most people will view four, eight, and 10 as better even numbers than they will 34 and 106. That's because even numbers uh, are things that we tend to, well, even numbers are divisible by two. Obviously that's the rule, uh, but there are even numbers that are sort of embedded within. Uh, single digit even numbers are contained within uh, the other even numbers. So they overlap and they share more features. Number, you know, the number four and number two are gonna be present in lots of other even numbers because that's uh, what you're gonna see in 54 and 64 and uh, 72. All of those even numbers will contain the single digit even numbers. So they overlap more with other even numbers as an explanation for why we would expect them to be more typical. So let's talk briefly about probabilistic views. And this will be the final concept that I'm introducing I think we still have time, it's 11.58, and I'm confident <laughs> that we will finish up on time. Uh, so a category member in this probabilistic view uh, is one that is not definite. Unlike the classical view, a probabilistic family resemblance view assumes that things can be members of multiple categories, or they can be really good members of a category or less good members of a category. Uh, they can be the apple of the fruit category, or they can be the pumpkin or the Hubbard squash of the, pump, of the fruit category. You wouldn't see a Hubbard squash and assume fruit right away, right? If you saw a bunch of Hubbard squashes in a pile, you wouldn't say there is a pile of fruit. Uh, even though you know they're fruits, they're not very good fruits. They're not very typical fruits. So category membership in this view is probabilistic. Uh, depending on your experience and depending on the features that you can perceive and how familiar you are with the concept, things can be classified more or less accurately. Some things like apple, we all agree are fruit. Other things like 
um, pumpkins, we're less sure. So there is more uh, ambiguity, more uncertainty, and a lower probability of being consistently classified uh, correctly. In this view, according to Wittgenstein's family resemblance principle and Roche's prototype theory, uh, a category has no defining properties, only characteristic properties, things that are associated. They share a family resemblance. And so the question is, how can we represent these categories? In the text, I discuss two possibilities, and these are both fairly uh, similar uh, models. Both of them assume uh, that you're trying to average, store the average of the common features. Uh, I'll talk just today about the prototype theory, but the exemplar theory makes similar assumptions. In a prototype theory, when you represent a category, you represent what is prototypically true. In other words, your concept for bird might be the birds that are most common, uh, medium-sized songbirds that show up at the bird feeder uh, in the backyard. Right? That would be the prototype of your bird category. A, German Shepherd or a Labrador Retriever might be a prototypical dog because it shares a lot of similarity with other dogs. So a prototype is a central tendency. An exemplar theory assumes that you can represent the central tendency by storing many uh, typical exemplars. Uh, you would just have more representations of robins and uh, apples than you would representations of uh, penguins and olives as being members of the fruit category. Uh, so they're both, they both make similar predictions. I want to talk about the prototype theory uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so let's talk about this prototype view, which is a summary representation. We can think about it as an average. Uh, if you think about the average police officer, you might have an average typical stereotype of what a police officer is. If you think about the average professor or the average university student, you might think about those typicalities. So an average person, uh, there may be no one particular professor or dog or police officer which conforms to that average, but it's the abstraction or the average of all of the individual experiences that you've had. Objects would be categorized uh, or classified because they share features with this average. So I wanna talk about a study that was done um, and I don't have a separate paper for this one because I just wanna do this as a quick example and then relate it to false memory that we talked about last week. Um, a study that was done in the 1960s and 1970s looked at how people abstract a prototype from information that they're not familiar with. Uh, so the question is, if we have a single representation, a summary representation, uh, what would that be? What would that look like? And how would we get it in our mind uh, with direct experience? Um, and this study was carried out by Posner and Keel. And they, what they did was they asked people to learn to classify dot patterns, uh, just patterns of dots on a screen, as about as abstract as you could possibly get. There's no rule, there's no features, uh, it's just an image. Let's take these nine dots in space and then we'll show how this is uh, set up and I'll do a quick demonstration. Um, so in order to define a category, we might pick a location of nine dots in space, connect them with dots, and define that as a prototype for a category. Uh, so that's the shape that's going to be at the center. And then to create training exemplars that I'm going to show you, we would take those same nine dots and just move them a little bit. So imagine this is like a constellation of stars, right? Like the Big Dipper, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about. So the Big Dipper and the constellation uh, connect the, the dots. Each one of these is a position in space. Uh, we can connect them to make a shape. Then we could move each one of them a little bit and it would be a shape that's kind of like the original shape, but not quite. You're just sort of morphing it a little bit or uh, moving its shape a little bit. So it looks like it's original, but it's slightly different. Maybe one, per, you know, one part of it sticks out a little bit more than the other. Then you go back to the original and you make another shape. And you go back to the original and you make another shape. And you could take this original one shape, which is the prototype, and you can make a lot of shapes around it that are similar to the prototype, but not exactly. Then we're gonna train participants to recognize a new category. Let's do that really quickly right now. I'm just gonna see if I can dim the light up here in the front so we can all look at it. Um, what's gonna happen here? That's the wrong one. I just, no, that's actually the opposite of what I want. I just wanted to, there we go. 
Is that a little better? I don't want anybody to fall asleep, but I wanna make sure that the screen is maximally visible. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you a series of training exemplars, new shapes. And I want you to look at each shape as I go through one second at a time uh, and try to abstract a category from it. Try to recognize them. Uh, and then I'm gonna test you on a series of about eight new shapes. And I want you to tell me on those new shapes whether or not they belong to the category that you learned or not. Does that make sense? They're all gonna be shapes of, made from these dot patterns, but some will be members of the category you learned, others will be new shapes entirely. Uh, so let's take a look at these really quick on the next slide, if I can get there. Okay, so here are the shapes that I'm gonna show you one at a time. Try to commit these to memory and then we will do the test. Almost done here. All right, now what I'd like you to do if you've got your device or your laptop. Um, access this link. It uh, should be on the slide that you have. Does everybody have a device that can access the link? And if you're home uh, online, you should also have this uh, on the slide. It's just a quick Google form. And for each one of these, uh, you're gonna click the link and it's gonna give you a shape. And it's gonna ask you if that shape is one that you remember seeing, uh, or is it a member of the category that you learned or not? So the answer is yes or no. This is like the ones that I saw or this is not like the ones that I saw. And I think there's eight of them. Then I'll wait just another minute here. And what we'll do is I got 31 responses. So I'll wait just a little bit of time uh, to collect a few more. And again, your answer is just, is this shape a member of the category that we studied? I, I'm assuming that just about everyone's done. Um, you can keep responding, but let's take a look and see uh, what our responses look like. So for shape number one, and let's go over here and look at it. Shape number one, it looks as if 100% of us agreed that that is a shape that we studied, um, which by the way, it is not a shape that you studied. Uh, it turns out to be the original prototype. Uh, and that's where I wanted to relate this to the uh, memory stuff that we talked about last week, where I suggested that in some of those studies like the Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott paradigm, where uh, you falsely recognize occasionally a word that you hadn't seen because it's common to all the words. Uh, this was the original prototype that we created with the dot pattern, but none of the study items were exactly this one. And if you don't believe me, um, you can go back and look, uh, and it's not one of the ones that we saw, but it shares its similarity with everything. Uh, because that shape was used to make every shape that you saw by just changing 
uh, the uh, position of the dots. It would be as if we took that Big Dipper shape, the constellation, moved the shapes a little bit. They would be all different shapes of Big Dippers, but you would also say that's a Big Dipper. Uh, and then if I never showed you the original Big Dipper and showed it to you, you'd say, yes, yeah, also a Big Dipper. I recognize that one. So I'm glad that everybody had a strong 100% prototype enhancement effect, which is what this known as. Um, and you can see that most of us liked exemplar number two, which is this one here, which you can see why it is also a good uh, category member. Um, and we're pretty much the same on exemplar number three correctly because it also looks like one that you study. But what about this one? Uh, this one is a little less clear to me at least. And it looks like it's a little less clear to all of you. So about half and half. We get to this next one. I'm going to say probably also about half and half, but we're sort of leaning in the no direction. Uh, when we get to this one, you should have all said no, or most of you said no, uh, because that is definitely not one that we studied. Uh, and in fact, that is a low typicality member. Uh, and when we get to the very, these last two, as a matter of fact, these are, the first one is the prototype. The next two are high typicality members, meaning that they were made with the same algorithm. Uh, the next two were low typicality members, uh, meaning they were made with more distortion. In other words, you move the shapes. And the last two were random uh, assignments. In other words, those last two objects uh, where most of us agreed, no, these are not things that we studied. These were not generated from the original prototype. In other words, I did not take the dot patterns and move them a little bit. I just created a whole new assignment of nine dot patterns, an entirely new constellation. So the only thing it has in common is that it has nine points, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't bear any structural or mathematical relationship to that original prototype. This is a really well-studied finding. Um, and I'm pleased that it continues to, to actually replicate even in these uncontrolled uh, environments. So let's go back here. So what we should have seen, um, and here's the proposed mechanism, and somehow I got out of my uh, presentation mode here. Let's, um, let's hide this floating meeting controls. All right, I'm going to sort of just give up on uh, trying to get back to the presentation mode that's going to take too much extra effort. Um, the hypothesized mechanism uh, is that as you saw those shapes, it activates primary visual cortex. Uh, primary visual cortex looks for regularities in visual information. Uh, as you see the next shape, it recognizes that there's some overlap, right? The same neurons that were active when you saw the first uh, shape are active when you see the second shape and you start to abstract the regularities. It would be as if I took each shape and instead of switching, taking it away and putting a new shape on, I just stacked them on top of each other as if they were transparent. And you would see that there were a lot of the same lines. That's what your visual cortex is doing. Your primary and secondary visual cortex are recognizing that regularity. So much so that when we get to the test phase, what we remember is not individual shapes because those, all those shapes kind of look the same, right? Uh, we don't recognize the individual shapes. What we recognize is kind of the average visual experience. We can recreate that. We can represent that as a concept or a prototype. It's the abstraction or the average of all of those shapes that you saw. If, for example, you have a prototype in your mind, that would be the first shape that you saw. So this shape right here, it's not one that you were actually trained on, but it's the one that created the ones that you were trained on. If I showed you a whole series of shapes that were created from this first initial uh, configuration, what should be left in the primary visual cortex or should be left as activation is something very much like that original average. Even if you didn't see it, it should be the strongest thing that's associated, kind of like the words uh, in that Dees Rodegram McDermott paradigm, where you saw the words around anger but you didn't actually see the word anger. And so it also was activated because it was in the same space. This is a visual analog to that. You're, it's a newly emerged category. You've never seen this exact shape before, but if you see the prototype, you say, yes, I've seen that one before. If you see a high typicality exemplar, in other words, a new shape that's created with the same algorithm, you would say, yes, I probably saw that before. 
if you see a new shape that does not look a lot like the original prototype that's in your mind, you might be much less clear. And those were those, uh, the fourth and the fifth uh, shape that we saw where most of us were starting to say it's about 50%. Uh, it's not as likely to be a category member. And then if we see a shape that was created with an entirely new configuration that bears no actual mathematical relationship to the original prototype, we're definitely sure that's not a category member. And this is the pattern that we saw uh, in, um, uh, in, in your data as well. Uh, and this has been shown since Posner and Keel's original study. Uh, we've used this in my lab, by the way, and we can show that rhesus macaque monkeys show the same pattern. Uh, young children show the same pattern. Uh, people with amnesia who cannot remember individual events and episodes also show the same pattern of abstraction, as if, although they never were trained on the prototype, it's enhanced and preserved and represented. Uh, and they show this uh, typicality effect whereby prototypes uh, receive the strongest recognition, even if they're not studied, uh, high typicality and low typicality items proportionally less, and then new items are recognized as not being members of the category uh, more often. Again, this seems to be a universal across different kinds of species, different kinds of organisms, uh, people with different kinds of uh, memory impairments uh, and so on. This typicality gradient is fairly robust. Okay, um, I just wanted to finish off with a couple of review questions. Um, these might be the kinds of ways in which I would ask questions on the exam. I got two or three questions and then we're finished for the day. Does anybody mind sticking through a couple of quick questions? Uh, these are not quiz items because remember quiz is multiple choice. According to the hierarchical accounts of conceptual representation, the level at which both within and between category similarity is high is referred to as which level? Subordinate. subordinate level. Yes, yeah, so the subordinate level has high similarity within, high similarity uh, below. What are the two core assumptions of the classical view? Remember, I presented two core assumptions of the classical view. This is classically a question uh, on the midterm exam where I ask people, what are the two core assumptions? Then I may ask you to explain one. Uh, what are the two core assumptions of the classical view with respect to how category membership is determined? Uh, strict definitions, uh, like they're defined by their category. Defined by necessary, so strict definition, uh, but then, yes, yeah, so by the necessary and sufficient conditions. So that's, so the one core assumption is that it's a strict definition around a set of jointly necessary and sufficient conditions is all or nothing, so you either are or are not a member. And membership is all or nothing. So we've got a strict definition according to uh, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions, and that implies an all or none uh, category membership. So it's a deterministic uh, category rather than a probabilistic uh, category. Oh, wow, yeah, look, it's right up there. Is it actually on your own notes as well, which sort of counteracts uh, the quiz nature of it? I meant to remove these. Uh, so the they actually could do it. But anyway, there they are. That's sort of the ultimate open book, open note. Um, is that my final slide? I think that is my final slide. That's the end of the slideshow. Thanks for coming, everyone. And those of you that are watching online, thanks for joining. I should have these videos. Um, I guess I should have these videos up online as soon as possible. And I'll see you next week. Uh, good luck on the quiz. And if you've got questions, those should be available uh, sometime shortly after the uh, after it closes at 9 p.m., you should see the answers uh, come up uh, online. Take care, everyone. Have a good week.